It's Tuesday, December 13th, 2011. I'm Rem. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, Eminent Domain. The board game. Let's do this. I've said this before, and I'll probably say it a lot in the course of my life. That but, you, had a, uh, you have a ton of opening bits? I'm going to count the pounds of opening bits and see if they add up to 2,000. Uh, what I'm going to say is that, uh, to quote Ghostbusters, I love this town. Okay. <laughs> I mean, let's see. What did we do? On Saturday, we went to the Nostalgia Train. We rode a subway car from no, the No, it's the 30s. Vintage Train, not yeah. the Nostalgia Train. It was called the Nostalgia Train on the MTA website. It's Scott. called the Vintage Train on the MTA website. I'm going to go, because they, they called it the Nostalgia Train. They even made a big deal about go shopping on the Nostalgia Train. There was an ad an on the MTA site saying, come ride the Nostalgia Train, Christmas shopping. This says, ahem... Take a ride on a vintage train. Yes, Take it's a ride called, on a vintage subway. Yes, the vintage, a vintage train subway. runs. The program is called The Nostalgia Train because that's what they do every year. That's the program where they make the train ready and run it every year. In fact, there's multiple news articles on this that say, page, quote, MTA brings back The Nostalgia Train. On, Come on, ride on the, official, the vintage train. On the official page, right, not only is vintage train in the URL, yeah. it says the word vintage train one, two, three. Over six times, and it only says the word nostalgia once on this entire page. Ah, but the graphical ads say the nostalgia train. Well, not in the official mta.info slash metrocard slash promo slash vintage train slash index.html. Regardless, we rode a subway train from the 30s and onward, and it was actually surprisingly yeah, similar I to my current it, experience. I thought it was going to be kind of cool, like, oh, worth doing. It was actually way awesome. Like, I thought it was going to be like, all right. All right I was mostly pleased with train. the number of people who were completely and utterly dumbfounded as it pulled up, and they did they were afraid to get on it. Yeah, that was the weird part. Is like, if I saw that train pull up, I'd be like, I don't care where the fuck this is going. <laughs> I mean, because I, the... I was like, I'm hoping it's going to like Andromeda. Because <laughs> I'll be like, oh, please, baby. Machine body? <laughs> oh, please. Yeah. I mean, even the garbage trains, I'm like, huh, I wonder where this will take me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not getting on the garbage, garbage <laughs> when train. When they're empty, I want to get on one to see where it goes. Yeah. Granted, it might go, you know, the opposite of Andromeda is garbage planet. You got to stop a garbage planet on the way to, you know, Man, whatever you want to go to, La Metal or whatever. I was also, you know, the doors are mostly the same. So, you know, I asked the conductor because they were just loving the shit out of this. They were yelling, all aboard. Well, of course, they only give like the ultra trained nerdy conductors on that thing. You know, they don't put the regular old. So MTA I asked guys. him, I'm like, what if I try to hold this door open? And he's like, you will break your hand. That's right. 90 pounds of I, force I, from each door. I wish. And there's nothing to stop it. And, be- I, and the new subway cars, right? The little rubber bits in between the doors where they bump into each other. You know, they've got a little flex to them. I touch the rubber bits on the old doors. They're basically rock hard, solid rubber that, like, you know, a car tire. I kind of want to go back to that because then people wouldn't be able to hold the fucking doors open. I know, right? And it's like, well, you got stuck in the door. You're dead. Sorry. <laughs> Not dead. He, he, it wouldn't kill you. But the guy it was like, what yeah. if the train started fucking moving? No, the MTA guy was like, yeah, we, we'd reopen it. But uh, your wrist would be broken. A lot of ankles got broken back in the day. Nice. <laughs> But on Friday, Nerd NYC Board Game Night, we rocked it up. On uh, Thursday, we were at Nerd Night, like we talked about in all the meta moments, doing a uh, lecture, a 20-minute version of Losing Should Be Fun. Which but- is pretty, actually, you know, I you know, I said all last time, like, hey, don't pay the money to go to Nerd Night to see us. And you know what? I was correct. You shouldn't have paid to see us. But there were two other things there well worth paying yeah, for. Yeah, the guy's lecture on uh, Cephalopods. mollusks. Cephalopods. Cephalopods are a subset of mollusks. Yes, but it wasn't <laughs> on. The topic did not cover all of Mollus. His talk oh, no, it was didn't. specific to cephalopods. But he was pretty awesome, and I talked to him. We're going to try to get him to Kineticon. Nice. Because the dude's never been to a con, but all his friends are. The so other like, dude who went after us did this thing using, like, dials, like they use for political stuff, but to evaluate OK Cupid profiles. I was dubious when he started, but then I was realized... Good. That dial-based humor is one of the finest forms of humor. We need to get those dials ASAP. Oh, my God. I'm, I'm working on getting those dials. I want to do something with them at Kineticon, at PAX, at anywhere. We're going to rock the dials. Oh, my God. We're going to have panels that are just like, yeah, dials. Woo! Turn them. Woo! We need to make a board game, video game, every, everything. But seriously, we had no Ooh, in idea. In fact, we should make an app for your phone that is just the dial. Oh, that'd be perfect. Yep. If it doesn't already exist. Okay. So we had no idea what this thing was going to be like, but basically... You know, we get to this club, and it was really rocking. Like, there were a ton of classy, nerdy people there having Mostly cocktails. Mostly ladies. Yeah. 
Mostly attractive ladies. Mostly. Hanging out. Everyone's cool. Everyone's smart. Everyone's, you know, debating and talking, except for the one rowdy table. <laughs> and Well, there were, I think upstairs on the left were actual OK Cupid employees who came because they must have heard about it. And then there was another rowdy table of people who worked at the same company as the guy who was doing the OK Cupid talk, but he did not work for OK Cupid. Yep. But uh, so we get in, and one, the main reason I was impressed, we were actually on the list. Yeah. I cannot tell you how many people invite us to things and don't put us on whatever fucking list they've got. Even Magfest. And both of us the were first on the year list. We went. And they were actually correctly on the list. It wasn't it didn't list like something else or, you know, just the word geek nights or anything yep. dumb like that. Everyone was smart, everyone was cool, and the place smelled like chlorine. I'm like, what's up with this? What's that smell? Then I realized that all the tables are on little islands and there's a little like bridge over just a floor of water. Yeah, it's a pretty cool space. It's also apparently pretty easy to get that space, so... Uh, Relatively. Uh, look forward to a Geek Nights-themed event there in the near well, future. Well, we need to... I think you can only get that space as long as you have at least 100 people who, and those people want to drink. Then I'm you can well get, aware. Then you can get that space pretty easily. I think I will get on that a, space... On a, on a weeknight. Much like how Luke Crane was able to double his power by combining with Vincent Baker for burning Apocalypse, Geek Nights could team up with some people to do a thing. Get 100 people to get drunk I think we could get 100 night, people on a weekday night in New York yeah right. because remember the real reason to live in New York is not for the stuff that happens on the weekend because everyone's life revolves on the re- weekends the whole point of living here is that stuff happens on the weekdays usually the more awesome stuff and if you live here it's really the only way to do that stuff yep if you, don't, be so if you rich, don't live in the city then if you try to do a weekday event after work even if you work here Going home sucks balls. Like you can so tell, like all night, the people who all run all like way. clubs or night, you know, restaurant, like nice places, they complain mostly about the weekend crowd because it's all the commuters and the out of towners. But the real quote unquote no true Scotsman city culture is Monday through Thursday. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the city's awesome. All right. Got any news? I do have news. Oh, do you? You know how we always fantasize or, or, you know, complain about the lack of unfulfilled potential and all these people are making crappy games? I believe we even did in a panel that was little more than us ranting for an hour. Yeah, why packs. don't they make a Pokemon MMO? Why don't they make a this? Why, why don't, don't they, they make, make TIE Fighter 2? Why don't they make Tribes 2 2? Why don't they just remake fucking Rampart right. plus Minecraft? Right. Well, none of those have been made, but somebody has made something that is the awesome. Uh... Ahem, I present to you Bandai Namco Mobile Suit Gundam Online. What this is, it is a Gundam game, video game, obviously. It is online, obviously. Is it an MMO? No, it is not an MMO. It's simply Gundam Battle, 52 versus 52, go. All in the same map, 52 Gundams against 52 Gundams, Xeon versus, you know, regular guys, Earth Federation. The real question is exactly what the controls are like because that Gundam pod I played in Japan well, look was at these, Gundam. Look at these in, screenshots. I would slide sideways. Do these screenshots look like they your, look your Gundam pod game? They Those look almost exactly like the Gundam pod game. I guess it's the home version of the Gundam pod game 52 versus 52. There is one other thing it's going to like. But lack. was the wasn't the Gundam pod game I imagine it was first person, right? This it was he, first person. This seems to be third person, more like a little virtual on. It was first person in the Gundam and you had the two giant joysticks. Well, this seems to just be the home version. I don't know if I'm excited about it because Well, I think it's going to it's going to be hard to play if you're not in Japan. Yeah, plus and don't every, speak Japanese. Every big game that's come out since But, but it's in alpha. Counter-Strike has pissed me off. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm mostly Counter-Strike Go is the only thing I'm really holding on to. Everything else take it or leave it. Also, Scott, I re- I I found something. There's a parallel MTA website. MTA.info slash NYCT slash service slash events slash nostalgia trained on HTM. Uh oh. That goes to this to basically the same site. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So I want to talk about this game a little bit because I think we geek bit it. I don't know if I even linked to it because we had so little to say about it, but uh, Gabe and Tycho of Penny Arcade were pretty surprisingly excited about Burnout Crash. And I remember the other burnouts being pretty fun to hang and, out yep. and you know, crash a car for four hours with friends. And since it was an Xbox arcade game, you know, I download the free demo because you can download a free demo of anything that's on Xbox. It's an average 99 cent iPhone game that they're charging 10 bucks for. 
Like, yeah, but the thing is, it's not even as good as other $1 iPhone games. Like, it's I, not as good as Angry like, Birds. I couldn't figure out, like, was I missing something? Like, we played yeah, it. And we're like, it's like people what? were going crazy over this game and how good it was. And I was like, why is this game good again? I mean, seriously, you don't even drive the car. You kind of steer it shittily and slowly into the intersection once. And then you press the button to make it explode. Periodically. Then you wait, and then you make the car explode again and move it while it's exploding and flying through the air from the explosion. And then wait. And then explode it again, and that's all you do is explode the car over and over again every time you push the button. There was so little to it that I was utterly dumbfounded. I did a lot of research to figure out if maybe like I was missing something, like maybe that was yeah. I was I was like, sure was I had to be missing something, or I was in the wrong mode because everyone loved the fuck out of this, and I but didn't know why. But apparently, everyone doesn't love the fuck out of it because uh, the reviews are actually pretty scathing, and pretty much everyone but Gabe and Tycho and a handful of people agree that it's not good at all but at least it's for, weird though right, it, it's not good for what it is in terms of being a console game that costs ten dollars even if it was a dollar on the iphone like i said there are other better dollar iphone games there's other better free iphone games i mean the whole point of burnout was not the high score it was seeing the crazy bullshit that happened but and to go crazy bullshit you need to drive and crash and then drive again this you drive a little bit and then you don't drive anymore i wouldn't even call it driving you steer a tank slowly into an intersection see what i would like to see would just would be more like some of the modes they had in the original burnout right and just simplify them and streamline them and make them a little more arcadey yeah right so it's like make the driving really easy give me sort of a twisty you know road to drive down give me some missiles to shoot and after i shoot all my missiles at, at different things spy hunter style i crash into something and then we add up the score from the whole thing and then i can drive again you know that would be kind of cool or maybe some multiplayer i don't know never mind the fact that you know i'm not one to I'm talking about for an xbox arcade game not for the phone i'm not one to complain about the metaphor of a game usually at least not in this context maybe in a lecture or something but uh the metaphor of the game is bullshit like it doesn't it doesn't make any sense and i just i don't get this game i, I do want to say one positive it. thing about the game it has some style especially in the music stuck to beat oh do, 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 it's got do, great do, do, style do, 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 for a for a do, 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 99 cent iPhone exactly. game it's it pretty actually, fucking great it actually has pretty good style for a 10 dollar game but <laughs> i'm not gonna pay 10 bucks for style when i can just go to youtube and get style for free <laughs> So I got one more little geek bite here because we played a game at the uh, annual front row crew Bacchanal in Philly called Beowulf. Yep. Which, unsurprisingly, was a literal retelling of the story of Beowulf. Yeah, you literally go event by event through the story of Beowulf and you have to play each event until you get to the end. Now, until you see at the end who, which player was the Beowulfiest. I'm not going to review it really because we played it once. I don't, I haven't really fully formed my opinion on it yet. I kind of liked it, but here's the deal. It has all the trappings of one of those crappy co-op games like uh, Shadows Over Camelot or uh, Battlestar Galactica. But it's not a co-op game. Well, yeah, you could have let me finish. I was building up to that, okay. that reveal. <laughs> I guess you spoiled it. Oh. It has all the trappings of that, like the same kinds of cards and the same kinds of interactions and putting cards up. And But you're all straight up in competition with one another. And it's basically a bid to see who gets fucked game. Every round you bid and somebody gets fucked and hopefully it's not you, but it's almost always you. Yeah. So basically you just want to, you know, you're going to have to get fucked sometime. So get fucked in the round where getting fucked isn't so bad. Yeah. But then, then again, everyone's thinking that so it doesn't work so well. Well, if, then if everyone really bids low, maybe you can win big in that round where, you know, right? It's like, well, if I lose this round, it's not so bad. But wait, that means everyone's going to be thinking that they're going to bid nothing. I could bid one and take a huge prize in this round. So the game devolved into random bullshit at the end. But much like that uh, horse racing game we played that one time. Did I win? I don't think I won. It devolved. I think Chase won. I think so. What I won something. Uh, oh, I won Eminent Domain, which we're going to talk yeah, about. Yeah, you did. <laughs> but uh, the game devolved into random bullshit at the end. But the random bullshit was surprisingly awesome and suspenseful because basically if you run out of cards to bid with, you can risk it. 
and there's a mechanic where if you fail at the risk, you're fucked. You take a wound and you're out. It's basically, I need one more card to, to stay in this game. Draw two, and if you get the card you need, you stay in. So and we everyone runs out like, of cards, and everyone just basically draws cards. We went we... around like 20 times at the end of the game. Like, it was off the fucking It's like fucking I had hook. so many, I had the most cards just in my hand available, so I was, I pushed it way up, and people kept risking it and managed to stay in the game, even though I had outbid them from this my game hand. had a great as a result it had a great vibe where you build like oh oh shit son oh, oh, oh. and then someone would draw like two doubles and you'd see the person who had legitimately gotten that far with the hand they built and nurtured throughout right, the entire like, game <laughs> against the guy full of the random bullshit look at you yell fuck and throw their hand down in disgust right. <laughs> but i don't know if this is a good game but i will say this if you have a friend who knows the story of Beowulf, like our friend Peter Olsen does, and tells you the story as you play, this game is amazing. Pete's also had a really good interpretation. Yes. So it was very modern. It was, it was a great interpretation of Beowulf, and that added a lot to the game. I don't think I would have enjoyed it if I just straight up played it like a board game. Yeah, I was start, that's why I was getting a little bleh, and I was like, that's why I was like, Pete, what is this thing? Though, so Scott, do you know who designed this game? Nope. Rainier Kinesia? Rainier Kinesia. <laughs> I wouldn't have asked if he it wasn't does, He does those kind of games. Like, he does. Like he did the Lord of the Rings game. That's so, why. I don't know if I can recommend this game or not, but uh, it's out there. Maybe we'll do a show on it later, maybe a video. We got to play it at least one or two more times. Yeah. It did give us a good idea for another spinoff show like RFE, though. <laughs> we, we know how to do the show where Pete tries to tell the story of Beowulf, and we interrupt him with perhaps the stupidest questions humans have ever asked. It doesn't matter because it still worked despite our stupid questions. <laughs> it worked really well, actually. Partly because Beowulf doesn't take shit from anyone. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Scott would ask, like, so why didn't he just fucking kill that guy? And Peter would be like, hold on. So Beowulf killed all of why them. Why did he just hang out in the Denmark meat hall all the time <laughs> after he <laughs> rescued it? Why would he go back to stupid Sweden? It's colder. So things of the day, if you have ever been to in the last, I don't know, 30 to 40 years, a strip club or a burlesque club or a gentleman's club or anything like that, they are scary seedy dens of losers. They're pretty much some of the worst well, places you can there go. There have been some nerdy burlesques in the city, which are relatively popular. Um, ah, but that's what I'm getting to. I'm personally not the biggest fan, but... There are like at least three of them, I think, if so, not more. This is each uh, one one another one. Many of our friends participate in them and enjoy them a great deal. In fact, a friend of ours is invited us to see one of them yeah. this weekend that she's in. Yeah. But anyway, so there's been a resurgence of burlesque, one among nerds, like cosplay, cosplay burlesque and all that, that has kind of harkened back to my thing of the day. Because back in the day, burlesque was surprisingly classy and... While being, you know, somewhat titillating, because these pictures are, well, you know, my thing of the day, pretty goddamn titillating. <laughs> One, they were adult women, which is, I guess, surprising <laughs> compared to the modern era of taste in porn. And two, one of these pictures perhaps sums everything up to me. It tells me that, one, humans really haven't changed that much in the last hundred years. No. But two, it tells me that the culture around pornography and, you know, mainstream gentlemen's clubs has changed a lot. Yeah. This is a picture from behind of D-Light. D-Light. Yep. She is a female impersonator. Mm -hmm. She looks like a woman from the back. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's dancing before an audience. It looks like straight up out of, uh, I don't know, 1950s Americana. And the audience is half women. And they're giggling and talking to each other. And the men are kind of laughing and... it. It, the audience reactions are pretty amazing. If we could go back to this era of burlesque, I would be a very happy man. Where going to a burlesque was like going to a regular movie theater and there'd be a packed house. But remember, in those days, it was much more boring and you couldn't get internet porn. <laughs> so it's like, you know. But dude, this is like 40-year-old women with the their thing, friends giggling at the female impersonator. Right, well, here's, here's the thing you understand, right? First, they invented VHS porn, and they invented porno mags, which meant you could take them home in private. And then they invented internet porn, so for, you didn't have to go to the porn store. Before all those inventions, right, when, say, a porno mag would get banned because, you know, it was the olden days, right, you had to go to a place, and everyone would have to go to the place at the same time because the show was at the same time. 
So everyone would go to the place, and you would go, and you would see everyone there, and you'd be like, yeah. <laughs> but now, because we can keep it private, people do. Well, what's the old That's joke? That's my hypothesis, anyway. What's the old joke? It's something like Catholics don't recognize the legitimacy of the Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, Eastern Orthodox people don't recognize the legitimacy of the Pope. Uh, Protestants don't recognize the legitimacy of Catholicism, legitimacy of Catholicism, and Southern Baptists don't recognize each other in the liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> Something along those lines. I don't know. I I look forward to this resurgence growing, and I kind of like this geeky because it seems like steampunk culture. Well, then do Mormons not recognize each other at Starbucks? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the steampunk anime cosplay cultures Jews are starting don't to recognize overlap each other at the barbecue with this kind of resurgence of classical burlesque. And I hope that the next thing to come back is vaudeville. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Maybe Gershwin style reviews. You can go see one right now if you I want. I can actually. I'm thinking about it. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Anyway, what? Oh, uh, things of the yeah. day? <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyone, you might remember, I did a thing of the day some many months ago uh, with the girls. The G girls. G G G G and it was very catchy, and I infected many people. This is perhaps, is this what, your second favorite thing right now? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, uh, so recently, right? Don't get me wrong. I'm not making fun. I, <laughs> I am with Scott on these girls, but same as with ponies, I'm not... At the level of Scott. <laughs> I'm close. I'm like 85% there. So basically the deal is, right, it's it's not that I'm actually, I don't, you know, like, like them that much. Like, just, you know, like, I'm a fan. I, mean, I kind of like it. But it's more that, like, I'm just so fascinated by it, right? It's like, this is company SM Entertainment, and they manufacture, you know, these musical groups. But the musical groups don't, you know, they can sing and dance, but they don't write music or create anything, you know? And it's like they're, it's almost like Hatsune Miku. It's like the reverse of Hatsune Miku, right? Imagine a distant future where people don't, people can't even remember that people would actually sing because computers do all the singing. So somebody m takes a person and trains them like an Olympic gymnast from when they're zero to do singing and dancing. And people are like amazed because they've only ever seen virtual idols. <laughs> and suddenly there's a real one. Uh, you know, so this company put together nine girls. It's Girls' Generation, SNSD. And they recently, you know, had some new songs and new albums. So they're exploding again. And, like, they were in Madison Square Garden. They came to New York. And they're sort of taking over the world. And the reason I thought of them again, you know, because I hadn't thought about them in months since they were my thing of the day previously, was that, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm like, huh, every time I think something's cool... After, like, 6 to 12 months, it becomes even more cooler. Like, I was into ponies before everyone else. <laughs> I was into DDR before everyone else. Uh, Scott, I want to point out, we were into ponies pretty early. I, I know, that's what I'm but, saying. But, not before everyone, right? Much of the first season, a surprising percentage of it. About half. We were halfway through season one. Yeah, and that we got into it afterward because so many people were like, you gotta watch this, and we were like, Really? Really? I'm just saying, we were into it pretty early compared to most. Before the, the exponential explosion. <laughs> before it was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, right? Yeah. We were into GDR before so it Scott, was in all the So, Scott, are you saying that SND is going to be the next it's, big thing It's SNSD. Nerds. I'm saying that I, you know, I was trying to think, what is there that I liked that, you know, is going to be big? And I was like, the girls. The girls, Jerry. The girls. Yeah, and I was right. If you go look at their stock on the Korean exchange, it's pretty much, you know, LA, you know, a log. It just goes, whoop. If I had known that I could invest in them when Scott first pointed them out, I would have. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you can. You, I think you'd have to go to the Korean exchange. No, I guess if there's an ADR, I can. I, I, I couldn't find an much. ADR for it. I looked a little bit. But I don't know how to search for that thing anyway. Um, so, yeah, they've got a new song and a new everything, and it's pretty catchy and, you know, the usual. That's how it goes. Um, and uh, so here they are. This video, which my thing of the day is, is from a thing called MAMA, which is the Mnet Something Music Awards, which is basically Korean Grammys. That's all you have to know about it. For some reason, the Korean Grammys were in Singapore. And for some reason, in 2010, <laughs> the uh, the, the red line will also be there. Right, 2010, the company SM Entertainment that does all these th these girls and guys and whatever uh, was was boycotting the MAMA for some reason. I don't know. It's on Wikipedia. You can learn it yourself. But in 2011, they went and they went hardcore. So they did some crazy remix. And the thing that I find most interesting is not only 
you know, does the girls mess up, which is pretty fascinating because it's sort of like watching the Olympic gymnast fall off the balance It was pretty beam. fascinating when Scott shows mm. me this video and he's like, wait, 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 that one's going to mess up. Ready? One, two, bam. Because <laughs> it's like, you know, Olympic gymnast falling off the balance beam. It doesn't happen that often. Well, it or, won't in our lifetime. We're going to see the complete share in Apple and it won't even matter anymore. I know. That's what I'm saying. It's the prelude. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, not only do they do a remix and stuff, but for some reason, the Korean Grammys are like this crazy concert that normal people go to. You know, if you, you can't go to the Grammy Awards in the U.S. You can't just buy a fucking ticket, right? It's all famous people from the bottom to the top inside of a theater. This is outside at an arena with the long stage, like for a real concert where they can, you know, march out into the crowd. And most of the people there are just screaming fans. And... Uh, I think if I was in charge of the MPAA or not the the RAA or whatever the you know the recording academy, I would definitely make the Grammys an outdoor or concert wait, wait, and wait, not wait. a theater you know clappy high school award night. Recording academy, whatever it is, <laughs> I don't know who gives out the Grammy awards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the assholes. <laughs> So in the meta moment, the book club book is a double book. Double book. Two books by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. I think it's Exupéry. I said it this time because I have an anecdote. All right. I started reading, like I started Wind, Sand, and Stars a while ago, but then I kind of stopped. I was busy, so I picked it up again. And I've been blowing through it because it's fucking brilliant. No kidding. Uh, I'm not picking shit here. Yeah. I mean... I'm not going to say whether or not it's more or less brilliant than The Little Prince, because that's what our show is for. But I will say this. I had it in my pocket, right? Mm -hmm. And I was standing in the elevator in my building. Uh, the top was sticking out. There was a French guy on the... No, and it was just the guy's name. The author's name. It wasn't the name of the book or anything. Mm. A girl in the elevator looks and says, Oh, I would guess it was The Little Prince, but that is far too thick. Is it perhaps Wind, Sand, and Stars? <laughs> and I said, why, yes. And we started talking, and it was great. How come girls like that don't uh, bother me in the elevator? So I was on the subway on the way home just now. And from, there was a uh, French Midtown. guy. No. And someone was, I was reading it, and someone interrupts me and says, excuse me, is that the same guy who wrote The Little Prince? And I was like, well, yes, it is. You should read this if you like The Little Prince. And he just went on about how Little Prince was, like, transformative to his life. Well, it is. That's yeah. the point. <laughs> this is a pretty damn good book. So if you needed no further reason to read it, carry it around with you because girls may hit on you. Oh, shit. I'm doing that now. <laughs> uh, other meta moments. Magfest, baby. What? 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 I got to practice that shit. That's right. But oh don't, don't kill the voice, though. You're and going fresh. it is confirmed. So I think I'm going to say, I don't know if it's on the website yet, but we are doing three panels at Magfest. Most likely. Well, no, it's confirmed. Okay. We are doing one, our own lecture. Remember Beyond Dungeons and Dragons, the first big uh, gaming lecture we Beyond did? Beyond Dungeons and Dragons. Second edition. Uh. We're basically completely redoing that panel again mm -hmm. because our bag of tricks is like brand new to these babies at MAGFest. That's right. We are going to be on the money-making game with two other very intelligent people who are probably going to poke amazing holes in any argument we even attempt to make. All right. And we are going to be on gamer motivations with a similar group of very intelligent people in the gaming industry. I feel... Like, we're going to get hosed, but I think it'll be fun. Whatever. Most of the time, we're going to be playing fucking games. Oh, so yeah. So if you go to MAGFest, don't even come to our stupid panels. Just go to the arcade I mean, and play games. Many of you met us at PAX or Kineticon, and if you want to hang out with us at a con, those are the worst possible cons to try to talk to us. Because I think my goal at MAGFest is to beat Ice Cold Beer. You're, you're going to do that? I'm just going to stand Michael, there. Michael Scott, I'm going Because you get to play all night, right? So once night rolls around, I'm going to go over to that, and I'm just going to drink the ice-cold beer. Until I will the trade you then. My goal is to beat any of the challenges beyond the easiest ones in I that challenge I did the Carmen arena. San Diego one. So yeah. it has to be one that has a rating of at least hard. Yes. Oh, no, I, I did the uh, Bionic Commando one next to you. We both did well, the same. Well, that's, that's like if I did the Mega Man one. That's bullshit. Scott, right? the Carmen Sandiego one was <laughs> trivial. Uh, I'm just saying that the Carmen Sandiego one wouldn't count. You have to do one that we both agree counts. Yes. I feel like we should bring the belt <laughs> and pass it back and forth all con. Why don't we just keep scoring a logbook? Seriously, go to MAGFest. Pre-reg ends in like three days and check us out on all the internet places 
FrontRoadCrew.com, Facebook, Go to. Google Plus, Twitters. I will link to forum. it. Visit the Geek Nights Room YouTube account because I've added a whole ton of videos, including most recently a bunch of footage from both the Penny Arcade Expo and Burning Apocalypse. Let's Con. make sure to make some awesome videos at Magfest, perhaps of ice cold beer, perhaps of me beating ice cold beer. Oh, you believe me, we're going to have video from Magfest because I got nothing better to do except play games. That's right. All right, Scott, we're going to do the show. We're going to keep listening to the girls. Uh, yeah. You realize, kids, every time I have paused this recording to uh, do anything, the girls have come out. No, I've played other things before. <laughs> it was only just this one time. <laughs> so Eminent Domain, I literally had never heard of it. It's okay for the government to take your property as long as they're using it for good <laughs> and you're, it's like a slum or something. <laughs> I never heard of it until a guy showed it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so we're at Nerd NYC board game night, doing what we usually do, playing some games, and we played some Marrakesh, which is always fun. And then carpets, guy, baby. And then a guy we were playing. Have with we did a like, show about carpets. I don't recall. I think so. Right. Anyway, and he was like, "Hey, you want to play Eminent Domain? I brought a copy." And I said, "That's a game I've never heard of." So yes, I do want to play. No, we it. didn't say yes yet. We were like, "What kind of game is it?" Pretty and much anytime someone says the, a game that I haven't played yet as, as a suggestion, I'm basically saying yes, but I'll question them out beforehand. So. Here's how I would describe this game to someone who knows board games. It is basically Race for the Galaxy went and had sex with... Oh, wait, what's the old game he said it was? This is Rome something something yeah, that Rome he couldn't remember the name of? Yeah, Rome something. the same mechanics. Yeah. But it's basically Race for the Galaxy had sex with Dominion. Right. It's a typical card deck building game, but it's also like Puerto Rico Race for the Galaxy with the role taking mechanism but where you choose a role every But it also steals from this old Rome game where, say, some, imagine if in Puerto Rico someone picked a role, like the builder. Yep. I could either build or dissent. And if I dissent, I get to take a coin instead, but I don't get to build. Yeah, the normal mechanic in Puerto Rico is I take builder, I build, and because I took the builder, I build better. Everyone else just builds. And they don't, you know, and if they don't build, they don't do anything. In this game, if you choose a particular role on your turn, then you do it better. Everyone else can do it, or if they don't do it, can draw a card in dissent. So it's like everyone always gets something, no matter what. And you and the, the roles, uh, unlike some of the other games, aren't like exclusive. So if I, you know, everyone could just keep researching over and over again and never do anything else but research. It'd be dumb, but you could. Now it also has, a, uh, before we get into kind of the details of it, it has a really interesting mechanic where, unlike in Race for the Galaxy, where you build your hand up and you only really do stuff on your turn, or Dominion, where you throw your whole hand away every turn, one... You can discard any number of cards at the end of your turn and draw back up to five. But two, you get cards pretty much constantly throughout the game because on anyone else's turn, you can piggyback on their action or dissent. And you piggyback on the action by playing cards that have the same action symbol. Mm -hmm. So as a result, it has a really good sort of catch-up mechanic in that... If you're not able to do stuff because everyone else is playing in a different optimal pattern, you're than drawing you. a ton of fucking cards. So on your turn now, you start with like ten cards in your hand. You do whatever the hell you want. You just have to be down to five at the end of yep. your turn. And otherwise, and you can you actually shuffle. go below five at the end of your turn. You can discard as many as you want, but you don't have to discard all of them. You just discard as many as you want, down to five or less, and then you get to draw back up to five. Now, so you can, you know, it's really easy to go through your deck, and it's it's a little it's hard to clog it up, especially since it's really easy to use like what research cards to get rid of cards yep. and get them out of the game. Now, it's not customizable like Dominion. You're not, you know, making your set of cards to be out there. The cards come with the game. You lay them all out, and there's a ton of them. And while they're all unique, they pretty much come down to a very small number of types, and then each one has a slight twist from there. But they're, it's not nearly the problem set I thought it would be. No. I mean, at first he pulls the game out. I'm like, what do you mean there's like 100 unique cards? This is bullshit. I have yeah, to memorize all this. How am I supposed to this? learn all these freaking cards? No, they're all like improved research, improved colonization. Yeah, and the thing is, most of the cards are not even accessible to you. Like, if your starting planet is a Saturn-type planet, then you're pretty much limited to only, like, three cards that you can get early in the game. And most of the cards in the game you'll never be able to even try to get 
it's well, the game will be over before you have a chance for those. So you don't even have to worry about them, at least not in your first playthrough. So you can start playing as a noob. You don't need to read all the cards like you do in Dominion where you have ten cards you have to learn. You can just read, like, three cards that are the ones that are going to be available to you yeah. and worry about the other ones later. Now, the big part of that is that if you... If your friends have played Dominion before, or any Dominion-like, and they've played either Race for the Galaxy or Puerto Rico, you almost don't have any rules to teach them. This game is so straightforward. Yep. Uh, another thing I like about this game, right, is it comes with, like, all these little plastic spaceships, and, you know, right? So it's, like, usually in a game, like Dominion, right, the way to get stuff in Dominion is with money. So it's, like, you got to find a way to make money to get stuff to get victory points. And that's pretty much the chain, right? It's, like, no matter what you need, you need money and buys. In this game, you want it, you can try, you, need, you just need victory points. And the two ways to get victory points, the big ones anyway, are to get more planets colonized or... Uh, to build, to produce goods and trade them, right? So what you can do is you can either get a few planets and use those planets to produce and trade and produce and trade and produce and trade. Which is what I did. Or you can just try to get a ton of fucking planets. Or you can try to do both those things in some combination. Because those are the, pretty much the only ways to get a lot of victory points. Yeah, now that's the big thing. It removes the situation that many of these kinds of games have. Both, It's funny how Race to the Galaxies and Dominions both have this problem. Not really a problem, but a sort of end game. The DPT. Dutchy mm -hmm. Panic Time. That's right. Where you know the game is wrapping up. So rather than continuing to crank your machine or go for a big score, you basically start buying cards that you don't need just because they're worth like one or two victory points at the end of the game. That's right. All the cards that do stuff in this game are worth bupkis. Yep. The only thing that's worth anything are those three things. And what it's kind of nice is that, you know, a lot of games I've played have, you know, multiple different strategies to victory, right? It's like, oh, well, you can go for this, you can go for that, and all of those things will give you victory points. But if you look... A lot of games, for example, Kalis, some paths are so much more efficient than others. Castle is the most efficient, right? The, there are other ways. You can try to do the jeweler, and, and the jeweler could win, but it's so much harder to make that jeweler happen. It's got a totally different curve. This game has three pretty much equal curves on three different victory paths. So you just pick one of those paths or some mix of them, and you can legitimately get a bunch of victory points, which means a lot of people can get a lot of victory points. So it doesn't come down to who picks which path as much as it comes down to who does their path more efficiently. Now, you also can't cock block. There's no direct attack, and there's no real indirect attack. Yeah, which is sort of slightly annoying. No, because annoying. instead, it, it's, a, it's an additive game instead of a subtractive game. I mean, I like Agricola. In fact, I love Agricola. I kind of like dicking but, people, though, and yeah, I, I miss the ability to dick. Yeah, I'm also... Here's the thing. I like... Direct dicking games, but oh, that's how you swing. The direct dicking games have a sort of fundamental, you know, gang up on the leader problem. <laughs> gang it up, huh? <laughs> and you can see why, at like, as you look through the years, direct dicking was replaced by subtractive dicking. Where looking through the years, yeah, it's, lemon party, huh? It's not where oh, I'll attack Scott and take his sheep. Instead, it's where I will go on the space that I know Scott had to go on so he can't get where the I had sheep to go that he needed. With my sheep? The indirect dicking. This <laughs> game... Indirectly dicking my sheep where I had to go? Instead, has a sort of... It's the opposite of dicking. It's a positive flow where instead of Taking trying to it? figure out what the other guy wants to do and denying it to him, you figure out what <laughs> you want to do, you figure out what he wants to do, and you try to chart a path where he can't ride on your coattails. <laughs> Riding on the coattails. So I know he's trying to build up his military, so I'm not going to play a military action that lets him ride on. I'm going to use actions to do my military. I'll let him use the rolls, and I'll ride on his coattails instead. <laughs> you like to ride? No, I said actions because uh, there's one other major mechanic, and this is kind of the coup for this game that put it from this is pretty cool to I bought it on Amazon as soon as I got home. Also, it's cheap. Yeah, it's like 20 to $25. Awesome. Yeah. Great price. Now, supposedly it was a Kickstarter game, and there's an expansion. There's bits well, I think for the expansion, the expansion in the box, but the game does not come with, like... so. There's, I think the expansion was a Kickstarter bonus. Yeah, there's goods, like types of goods on the planets in the game. But in the game we played, those don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. But I believe they mean something with the expansion. I wasn't 100% clear on that. We have to play it again once it arrives, which might be tomorrow. But... You don't just have rolls. Every card has a roll or an action. And on your turn, you play an action, which is just you, 
and then you play a role. Right. You don't have to do the action. Like, so, you know, and a lot of times, like, you know, the, you, there's no reason to do the same thing as an action and a role because the role encompasses the action. So you'll, you know, the action is always going to be different than the role. It gets rid of the situation like in Dominion where, you know, the number of action cards is such a highly controlled and highly sort of game deterministic mechanic yep. of the cards that are face up. And the thing is, you know, the game is good because you always are just so frustrated that like if only I could do the role and then the action, I would be set. But you can't. Yep, so you it's the Java the, situation. You have to do the role and let it go around the table, then do the action. Then I mean, <laughs> imagine if T&E, how many times do you think, oh my god, if only I could take three actions in Java. If only I had one more action point. Those games, I imagine the way they balance them is they just have a bunch of Germans sit around, and they play the game with, say, 20 action points. Then they play again with 19, 18, 17, 16, and as soon as a fist fight breaks out, they stop putting the number down, and that's the game. Yeah. But yeah, it's really good. Uh, so the, the other thing I like about the game, right, is that you have to colonize these planets. So you you, you use uh, one of the actions. What was it? Uh, There's colonize. No, the other, what was the green oh, one? Oh, so you have to explore. The exploring one gets you planets, but they're face down in front of you. So you get planets in front of you. Then you want to flip the planets over to actually activate them so that once they're activated, they can produce goods. They can give you bonuses like making your hand bigger. And they give you victory points once they're flipped over. But... There's two different ways to flip them over. You can flip them over with ships and attacking them with military, or you can flip them over with colonization, which is basically diplomacy. Now, this is the huge thing. They're basically, the game has two completely independent currency streams, and all the planets cost different amounts right. for either one. It's like if in Dominion, it was like, you can buy this for five golds or two potions. three potions. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, I can I can either do potions or I can do money. And I don't have to do both. Doing both actually is kind of dumb. Not my plan, and actually it was working pretty well, is I focused on colonizing, but... I took advantage, instead of trashing, because that's a trash mechanic, instead of trashing my military cards, whenever I had them, I rode on people's coattails and built up a small reserve of colonies, or not of colonies, of ships, to then hopefully snipe up a quick planet near the end of the game. Yeah, it's, it's actually tough, right? Because I'm sitting there thinking, like, well, I don't want to keep picking colonize and military because then I'm helping everybody, right? I just want to keep picking one that no one else is picking so it only helps me. So I'm like, I'll pick military. I'll go all out with the ships. No one else will pick ships. And thus, when I pick ships for me, it won't help anyone else. So I did that. But... It's like when other people pick colonize, I was dick. So it's like, well, I kind of want to pick colonize sometimes, but I don't want to pick it a lot because that helps other people. So it's sort of like you want to go, you want an apple and you want an orange, and you're not quite sure what the right balance is. So it's like I did, I did like thirty, I did like seventy five percent military, twenty five percent colonizing. Right, and it's, it's like, telling because the colonizing just sort of came in for free when other people picked it. So I'm like, I well, was doing. It's funny we were playing kind of mirror strategies, like we were on the opposite side of these kind of opposite side of the coin mechanics. And Scott won, and I was basically he beat me by like one point. I beat you by two points. Well, because you had that bullshit luck of the card, the exact card you needed, basically. I was guaranteed to win the card that I bought unless with Scott my had research unless Scott had one card that he had bought in the course of the game in his hand by the time it was his turn on the last round. So I forced it and then he had the card so he won. But uh yeah, Scott was first place, I was second place. That's right. It was a good game. I want to play it again. Yeah, it's very good. I won Marrakesh though, so fuck you. <laughs> the random game. <laughs> Wasn't that random? This game actually this game has no right uh, as randomness of the planet stack. Yep, but that is and it has randomness. Uh, that's it. Of oh, your randomness deck. of the draw of your yes, deck. Yes, your yes. deck's draw. That's right. But not your deck's odds. No, not at all. So very little randomness in this game. But if you like Race of the Galaxy, if you like Dominion, if you like Puerto Rico, if you like any deck building or any of those, sorts this game of games, is surprisingly great, especially is, considering it's at most twenty five dollars. It's thirty two dollars and four cents on Amazon. Uh, I just bought it on Amazon for twenty three dollars. Well, I see it on eminent domain for 3204 on huh. amazon interesting maybe uh people were buying it i don't know maybe uh seven wonders is 3558 uh, that's a good price that is one interesting thing we played it with four that felt right it's two to four players oh and everyone agrees it's best with three players interesting which think about it all the three player games that have the fundamental breakdown 
have either indirect dicking or direct dicking that allows the uh, apple apple orange. I can actually see it being best with three, right? Because you've got you know you've got the military, always, you've got the colonizing, and you got the producing. You've also there now got three, to choose between two different strat. Like every time you take an action, you have two players to look at. And most likely, any action you do will benefit one or right. the other. But there's three pretty much paths to victory points. So with four players, two people have to pick the same one. Yep, and, and I had to share the are... same one with the experienced player who brought the game who was sitting to my right. Right, so those two people are pretty much going to be sort of dragged down. Or maybe they'll be dragged up by appling with each other. It's a tough call. No. Right? No. 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 And then the other two people basically, right? So it's like, well, you know, with three players. I was not players, dragged up by him. He bought things I needed. Yeah, with three players, everyone can pick, you know, pick their own path and see who does their path most efficiently. With two players, it's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that goes undone. But I feel like that, this elegantly gets around the three player problem by having. Not, it has like the positive. There's no you can't example gang to up dicking. on. You can't gang up on people because it has no digging. Yes. So three players is just fine. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brand OK for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.